Good morning. Welcome to the Board of Supervisors meeting for Calaveras County. Uh, Madam Clerk. Today we have three closed session agenda items. Item one, pursuant to government code section 54957.6, personnel matter, conference with labor negotiator Judy Hawkins, Director of Human Resources and Risk Management regarding Deputy Sheriff's Association, Sheriff's Management Unit, Service Employees International Union, and Calaveras County Public Safety Employees Association negotiations. Okay. Is there any public comment on this issue? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Item two, pursuant to government code section 54956.9D1, conference with legal counsel regarding existing litigation, Jed L. Richardson, the Cal County of Calaveras et al. Calaveras County Superior Court case number 17CV42875. Public comment on this agendized item. Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Item three, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation, one case pursuant to government code section 54956.9D2. Any public comment on this agendized item? Seeing none, at this time will we, will we recess two closed agenda, I'm, I'm sorry, the closed agenda items. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Board of Supervisors meeting for Calaveras County. There is a microphone. Would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? Madam Clerk. Report of closed session. Pursuant to government code section 54957.6, personnel matter, conference with labor negotiator Judy Hawkins, Director of Human Resources and Risk Management, regarding Deputy Sheriff's Association, Sheriff's Management Unit, Service Employees International Union, and Calaveras County Public Safety Employees Association negotiations. As to labor negotiations for the Deputy Sheriff's Association, the closed session is ongoing and will be reported out at the completion of the meeting. The remainder of this item, there is no reportable action taken. Item two, pursuant to government code section 54956.9D1, conference with legal counsel regarding existing litigation, Jed L. Richardson versus County of Calaveras et al. Calaveras County Superior Court case number 17CV42875. No reportable action was taken. Item three, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, significant exposure to litigation, one case pursuant to government code section 54956.9D2. No reportable action was taken. Thank you. Madam Clerk, announcements? Yep. Is there any no? oh. Announcements. This is a time for board members and county staff to provide updates of upcoming county events that may be of interest to the public. Is there any announcements by the Board of Supervisors at this time? Any announcements by staff? Sheriff DiBasilio, good morning. Good morning, Board, Mr. Chair, ladies and gentlemen, how are we doing today? Um, I'm here to just kind of give you an update on some of my staffing levels and what's going on within the sheriff's office. Um, I have a letter here, <laughs> excuse me, I have a letter here that was written um, by one of my uh, employees that um, is quitting and moving on. So I'd like to take a brief moment and read it to you. Um, I believe that you'll be getting a copy of this through uh, HR, but just so you know. It says, it is with deep regret that I'm leaving 
the Calaveras Sheriff's Office to further my career with the Stockton Police Department. I would like to discuss one specific issue as to why I am leaving. My starting wage for the Sheriff's Office was $23.24 an hour, and after four years of service, I currently earn $27.09. Sadly, a large portion of my earnings go towards family medical and paying my own retirement. My bottom line take home is much less. I'm now driving 40 minutes away to earn in the upper $40 an hour range, more than double what I make here. I understand we cannot compete with these types of larger agencies, but the pay discrepancy is almost insulting for what we ask our deputies to do. As a four year deputy, the county is losing my patrol experience and someone who wanted to invest in our community. This is immeasurable to calculate on paper. I'm leaving this agency in good standing and known as one of the higher producing officers within the department, leading an arrest this past year. Yes, I am replaceable, yet I have witnessed a gross retention issue plague this agency due to meager pay. I am currently one of possibly six deputies leaving to pursue more equitable pay. What we are asked to do for $27.09 an hour isn't worth the risk and extreme workload. Our marijuana grows have increased our call volume and violent crimes. It was not uncommon for me to respond to a heavily populated marijuana grow alone and due to poor staffing caused by low wages, I didn't have the staffing for backup. Realistically, who would continue this dangerous career path without adequate comp compensation for the risk? Let me make my point clear. I am grateful for my opportunity to start my career with the Calaveras Sheriff's Office. I am not a disgruntled. I merely want to provide a future for my family that the county cannot offer. We all know deputies need more pay. I hope you realize until the gap in pay is reduced, you will continue to lose qualified officers like myself and continue to be a training ground for other agencies. Um, he is one that has left this week. I have another one that just turned in their equipment that is leaving to go to Lodi. Uh, Lodi is about a $12 an hour bump in pay. Um, as I was walking out the back of the office, I had another young man come to me and tell me he's going to San Bruno. He lives in Arnold. He said he's been priced out of Arnold. He says he is taking his credit cards up to about $10,000 because the amount of money that he makes here doesn't pay for his gas, his rent, and everything. He's just, he, we're pricing him out of our county. So I just wanted to bring this to your attention. I know that you guys are in negotiations. I know a lot of people have come to me and asked me why I'm not giving these people raises and they need to understand that's not my job. I don't give out raises. If I did, we'd be paid a whole lot better. It comes to the board and what you guys can afford through a budget. So I kind of threw you under the bus a little bit, um, but it's reality. I, I don't do that. You guys do. And I want you to be aware. And we've talked about the training ground process, um, but I want you to understand that people are not leaving because they're disgruntled. They love the county. The problem is the pay. So that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Sheriff. Any other comments or announcements by staff regarding events? Seeing none, Madam Clerk. Oh, I'm sorry. CAO Lutz, I apologize. Yeah, I, I'll just kind of make the, um, the first announcement with we had been talking through closed session about the appropriate time for county administrative officer to report out on any key issues or items. I'm kind of thought that as opposed to the um, board report out at the end that this would be a better time. What I just wanted to make a um, brief statement or announcement on was um, one thing we're watching very closely is the CalPERS discount rates. And on December 18th, the CalPERS board had a um, meeting again basically to evaluate their portfolio for the year. And the way that works, they're given the portfolio mix that, um, that accounts for what the expected rate of return might be, but also what the risk um, is within that expected rate of return. Obviously, a higher rate of return equals more risk. The board um, voted to continue its present course with its basic portfolio mix, minimal changes, which means the discount rate um, is staying at 7%. And that's the number that we look at closely. Um, one of the portfolios that they were looking at would have brought it down to six and a half percent, which um, with every, um, every really tenth of a percent there that you see has a significant impact on um, our reporting requirements and the amount of unfunded liability that sits on our books. 
and in turn, we as the county have to be paying back. PERS has set a um, payment schedule for all counties, as most all counties are in the same boat with having unfunded liabilities. And so what this means is for the time being, the numbers stay at what our current projections are, um, which we know is still a major challenge, which is also why we have the pension um, subcommittee of the board that's um, evaluating all the options that might be available to us to at least manage um, the, the payment and try and insulate the county from some risk. Yeah. Thank you, CEO. Madam Clerk. Item four is from the Board of Supervisors, election of the 2018 Chair of the Board of Supervisors. I move that we nominate Tofanelli as Chair. Some discussion. Uh, is there a second on the nomination by Supervisor Clapp? I would second it. Second it. Discussion? Gentlemen, it has been nine years since the Board of Supervisors has been, has had a chairman from District 2. I fully uh, respect and think uh, Supervisor Tuff and I would do a heck of a job, and there's no doubt sitting next to him for the last year of his, of his abilities. But as a function of uh, fairness, as we rotate this, I would respectfully request your vote for chairmanship to go to District 2. Thank you. Any further discussion on the current motion? Hearing none. We'll call for a vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Public comment. I'm sorry. Bonnie, how are you? I was just going to call for a point of order. All right. Uh, Bonnie Newman, uh, Double Springs. I've been watching the Board of Supervisors for the past nine years, and there's usually a natural succession or rotation of leadership roles that allow each district to have representation on this board. Only twice that I'm aware of, or that I've seen myself, that that method was not followed. A few years back, Darren Sp Spellman was passed over with cause. I liked Darren as a person. He was funny but he was not a good supervisor. He came late, he left early, he'd walk out sometimes. He never came prepared. He never brought paperwork or reference material, kind of like Mr. Clapp does now. Then two years ago, a great injustice was done <coughs> to this county when three members of this board obviously colluded and conspired to deprive District 2 of their leadership role. <coughs> this impacted Chris Wright. Joe Kelly, handsome guy, funny, smart, did I say handsome? He called those three board members a cabal. A cabal is a small group of secret plotters and schemers. It was obvious to me a stooge that don't know anything, that a violation of the Brown Act had occurred. I had to get up and call for a point of order. The chairman of the board had to refer to county council to see if that was proper. Now, I also like Cliff Edson as a person, but he didn't even know proper parliamentary procedure and yet he was voted to be the leader two years in a row. And District 2 was again denied leadership role. Now if I, for any reason, think that there's been a conspiracy or a collusion or a violation of the Brown Act, you're gonna have to call the cops to come in here with a straight jacket because I'm gonna go crazy. I'm gonna go berserk. Because I've seen unfairness I've seen people not acknowledged for their qualities or their leadership abilities. And I think it's time we do justice and allow everyone a proper representation. Each district deserves to have their, someone from their district serve as leader. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning, Mr. Chairman and members of the Board of Supervisors. My name is George Fry. It was approximately one year ago that I stood before you and uh, advocated for Jack Garamendi to be the um, chair of the Board of Supervisors. And my point was that District 2 did not follow in the rotation, even though there's no laws or anything, but it was just the, the way it's supposed to be or has been. I can recall three times, Bonnie recalled two, I can recall three times um, when they didn't follow suit. The very first time is when Tom Tryon asked Marita Calloway if he could be the chair because he had children or young adults in college and he needed the money. That's, that was the first time. You know I've been coming to these board meetings forever. The second time was Daryl Spellman and I absolutely <coughs> agree with Bonnie's comments about that. The third time was uh, Mr. Um, Cliff uh, Edson and um, although I can't prove it, it smells of a violation of the Brown Act, what went on there. Um, today, we have the opportunity, you do, to um, have Jack Garamendi be the new chair for 2018. I'm kind of disappointed, and I, I'm going to be frankly honest about it, I'm kind of disappointed that Supervisor Toffinelli didn't uh, uh, deny the, um, the motion um, in good faith to Supervisor Garamendi. Uh, I'm really disappointed in Clyde Clapp and Dennis Mills for having made the motion and the second. I just don't get it. I have been coming here for nearly 40 years and this, if this happens today, it's just another travesty. I just don't understand that Jack is very capable. Maybe you don't know his background, but he has an undergraduate degree, he has a graduate degree. He and his wife served in the Peace Corps in South America, and uh, he's uh, on the Board of Regents for UC Merced. He's uh, uh, he was a reserve officer in the Army, and uh, I just don't get it. He is so, um, he Thank is you, so qualified. Thank you, Mr. Fry. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Chair, can, can we just take just a moment? Is, we have, we have some... Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, apparently our speaker clock is not working. Uh, the visual on the podium. Uh, we are keeping time with uh, Madam Chair. So if she says you're done, you're done. Can, can you at least give a 30 second indication? They have 30 seconds left. Uh, Robin Bunch, Sheep Ranch, District 2. And I would just like to say as a matter of fairness, I really do think that District 2 should have the opportunity to chair the next um, year for the Board of Supervisors. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. So, as usual, our public. Mar oh, Marty. Marty Crane. I'm sorry. Uh, just. Go ahead. Oh. Okay, thank you. She had been standing in the back. Go ahead. As usual, the observant public here has spoken very succinctly. And while I agree that uh, Supervisor Tofanelli could do a fabulous job as chair, um, I, and I agree that um, George seemed surprised that you didn't, um, that you didn't um, pass on that or recuse for that, um, there's still time. And this, looking at this, looking at all that's happened over the years and watching as all this happens, Calaveras County needs some heroes you could be the first one. We're gonna be calling for more heroes throughout the day and the coming weeks and um, 
uh, it's all about leadership and being qualified for doing the job. So please consider Jack Garamendi as the chair and maybe Supervisor Tofanelli as co-chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, ma'am. Hello, I'm Megan Guthrie. Um, pretty much everyone has said what I would say ditto to. Um, I'm Abigail's mom. I've been working with politicians since she was born. And I usually work on a state fed level. And I've just got to say that um, I'm so proud of Jack Garamendi. He is truly a politician. We are so honored and gifted to have a man of his stature in our community, let alone he is my D2 supervisor. Um, I really think it is D2's turn. Not only do I think it's D2's turn and he is the most qualified person to be on the position, um, D2 is in the most trouble. D2 had the fire, the brunt of the Butte fire. D2 has a lot of issues with the cannabis and everything that we need to deal with in this community. And there is no one better qualified to deal with it and our district needs focus, and we need to rebuild our community. And I've got to tell you, I call a lot of politicians on behalf of Abigail, and every time I call Jack, he answers his phone, he talks to me, he's been to my house, he has visited me, he cares, and I vote for Jack. And I really hope you consider Jack Aramendi. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Good morning, board. My name is Danielle, and I'm from Avery. I'm here to speak on the behalf of my son, JJ. Uh, I apologize. Last time I was before you, I did not know there was a three-minute time. Today, I do. I'll address it in a moment, Mr. Pry. Ma'am, we're on an agendized item, and I, I, I have to make sure I did that we follow these procedures. Okay. So. I, is this something public that you're comment. reserving for public comment? Yes. Okay. Now, this is an agendized item, okay. and we'll hear you then. Mr. Pry, does that satisfy your point of order? Thank you, Chairman. Not a problem. Thank you, sir. Good morning. It's my belief that if you've only served for one year on the Board of Supervisors, no matter how illustrious your career has been, that you need to earn it here. And for my part, he has been, Jack Yaramendi has been a pro pot from the get go. Proper representation for the constituency who are out there shaking their heads about how this pot issue has been pushed down their throats is just beyond comprehension. And um, I hope and pray that you guys will choose a board chair that represents the constituency out there. The people that don't feel that it's worth coming here because they won't be listened to and they don't think they have any power. I'm sorry that they all sit back in their cha chairs watching uh, television and doing whatever they do today or any other Board of Supervisors meeting day, but I'm pretty angry that they are just sitting there not doing anything, not calling their Board of Supervisors, not keeping up on what's going on in this county, not knowing about all the violence that has occurred because of pot. Thank you. <coughs> morning, Ms. Renke. Good morning, uh, Vicki Renke, Angels Camp. I just wanted to support the nomination for uh, Tofanelli. I ac agree with a lot of what Patricia just said um, about experience as a board member for the county. Um, we all know that Gary sat on the board prior, so he has that experience of running the meetings. Um, I don't believe in, well, you're next in line. That's, that's really not a good way to run government and your business. So anyway, I just want to say that I support that nomination and that's the reason why. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 
Any further speakers? Ms. Morris? I just wanted to say something, Susan Morse, District 4. I just wanted to say something about this whole process. In my opinion, each supervisor has, they, they were elected for a cer certain purpose. They, they supposedly went out and told the public when they were elected what, their, um, what they believed in and what they um, uh, were running on, the issues that they were running on. However, once they become a supervisor, I think I look to you because your vote is for all of the people in the county, not just your own district, but I look to each one of you personally. I'm with Residents Against Commercial Marijuana. I think many of you know that. And I have received numerous calls throughout, the, throughout these last two years, mostly this last year, from District 2 where they, people have said, I have sent my supervisor emails and I haven't received an answer. In fact, I even received a call about, maybe in October, November, where they had received email back message saying, um, unread and deleted. These people call me for assistance, do something. I, I tell each one of them, talk to your supervisor, write letters, whatever. They say we don't get any responses, we don't get responses to our, um, our emails or phone calls. So on, because of that situation, I really think that it should be someone who is going to be the chair who will respond to this, his constituents plus all of the county. And I will say that most of the other supervisors have always responded to me and the people that I know. So I think that's a very huge um, requirement. And I can say personally, personally, I have not contacted Supervisor Garamundi, so I can't say you haven't done it with me because I haven't done it. But I have heard over and over again. And I don't mean, I'm just telling you what I've been told and when people call me and are concerned. That's it. Thank you. And I, I would urge you to um, elect Supervisor Tofanelli. Okay. Thank you, Ms. Morris. Good morning, Mr. Sagala. <coughs> Good morning, Al Sagala, Taxpayer Association. Uh, this seems to be all about pot. This, you know, is, am I wrong? Is this, is this the issue we're debating now? Is is the marijuana or cannabis? Uh, well, hoping that it's not, and that we're really uh, here to to evaluate and select a supervisor that'll do the job in an efficient manner, <clears throat> in a trustworthy manner. Uh, looks like we veered away from that that purpose. Um, even if uh, the selection is uh, Gary Toffinelli, vice chair can be Jack Garamendi, yeah. which means he'll be in succession for the next uh, next time. And then you have that balancing that's desired uh, by at least some here in the room. Does that make sense? Thank you. Thank you. Further comments? Thomas Guthrie, District 2. I can only speak from my own experience, but uh, I've called each of the supervisors. I've emailed many, and uh, I don't get any response back from any of them. <laughs> I do get a response back when I make a phone call to Jack or I email Jack on any particular issue, and that needs to be said. As far as qualifications, uh, I'm sure Mr. Tofanelli is qualified. I'm sure Jack is qualified. I'm sure each and every one of the 
Board of Supervisors is qualified. If, uh, if there is some sort of uh, tradition of succession to the vice chair to then become the uh, chair of the board, I see no reason why there should be a, a deviation from that. Um, it is important that each district gets their representation. And to be denied that for so long, uh, that being district two, being in the chairman's seat is, uh, is not right. And I would hope that the members of the board would take that in consideration when making their decision. Thank you. Further comments by the public? Mr. Stopper? <clears throat> Mr. Stopper, District 5. <coughs> Sorry, I just walked in, but caught on real quick. Apparently, we have a motion before us right now for uh, Gary to be chair. Um, boy, four years, three out of four, District 1. District 2, we just heard from Mr. Segala that traditionally having, being vice chair, succession becomes chair. This would make three, let's see, three of those last four years that vice chair has been district two, or yeah, well, you're district two, right, Jack? Yes. <laughs> um, The prior District 1 supervisor made a move to take chair a second time in years. The reasoning behind that, I mean, a lot of people here are aware of. Um, not necessarily any of us or all of us agreed with it at the time. Um, but in succession, we this will be another year that District 1 would move forward, and then this puts, other than District 3, which is in the interim this last year had the chair, puts everyone else back another year. We just, we need to seriously think about how we're gonna move forward. Everyone in the county does need to be represented fairly. And, you know, I, there's other counties that use seniority for succession. Just all things to consider, gentlemen. Um, district 2, I have family in District 2, and District 2 has not been represented in a very long time on our board. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Any further public speakers on this issue? Seeing none, we'll bring it back to the board. Any discussion? Everybody has their lights on? Oh, just so we can I have a comment. Uh, I intend to make a nomination for chair, and I intend to make a nomination for vice chair at the proper time. Having stated that, public comment's been held, discussion's been held, I'll call for a vote. All in favor of Supervisor Tofanelli to be chair of the Board of Supervisors indicate by saying aye. 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 All opposed? No. No. This is ridiculous. Mr. Fry, please respect the chambers. I, I understand. I the chambers, it's okay. But this is <coughs> That's okay. Yeah. This time we're going to take a short five, ten minute break. Unbelievable. Okay. We just got voted, right? Council? Let, let's let's move on. Instead of taking a break right now, let's move on to um, nomination for vice chair. Ladies and gentlemen, does it. please. We're having a discussion. We will move on to the next item, please, Madam Chair. Yeah. 
Item five is from the Board of Supervisors, the election of the 2018 Vice Chair of the Board of Supervisors. Do I have a nomination? Do we have any discussion? You do, I Mr. Do, Chair. I do Mills for, for Mr. Vice Chair. Supervisor Clapp, I believe I had the floor. Is that true? Super, uh, Mr. Chair. Oliveira. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to nominate Jack Garamendi for Vice Chair. Second. Is that a motion or a nomination? That's a nomination in the form of a motion. In the form of a motion. I have a second. We have discussion. <coughs> no discussion. I'll bring it out to public comment, please. George Fry again. It, it's, it's just unbelievable that this board would do what they did. Just unbelievable. Mr. Clapp and Mr. Mills have been trying to attack Mr. Garamendi for a whole year. George, we're discussing the nomination. Uh, of yes, and I'm talking about it. I just can't believe. I obviously support Jack Garamendi for the vice chair. This is just ridiculous. You guys need to get your heads examined. Um, Marty Crane. So, um, of course, of course, <coughs> I would support Jack Garamendi as vice chair. I would support him as chair. Um, so, if my math serves me from what we've heard, this means that going into the fifth year, is it right that four years would have been represented by District 1? Megan Guthrie. I would just like to um, say I'm really disappointed in our community right now, in our government. Um, I've been struggling with Abigail for 17 years. She's going to be 18 in February. And I've never really had anyone representing D2 or my daughter's life. And Jack Garamendi comes along and he's been around and we really need representation here. And I just want to know which one of you is going to call me back when I call you. Because I email you and I call you all the time. And right now I've been in quite a situation. I'm not getting answers from anybody except for Jack Garamendi. So, yeah, I'm glad he's vice chair. I think he made the wrong decision. And uh, I'm not real happy with this whole county government system right now because I check every box. I'll talk about that later in public comment. But you've got a kid up here in D2 that hardly ever hits this county. And none of you are talking to our family or what it means to your budgets, by the, by the way. That's going to affect your budgets, this kid. Because if you notice, it's 10 o'clock and she's not in school. About, we are talking about I'm talking the about chair, vice chair. Vice chair. And I'm talking about D2 having representation, having safety, where I feel <clears throat> safe as a constituent, where I feel like my representatives are talking to me whether I live in the district or not, helping me with my daughter, my safety, and my situation. Because obviously, with my situation with my daughter sitting in this room, I need, and you're, and you're smirking. Why would you smirk? I take exception to your statement that you don't talk to me or my wife. The amount of hours that she had spent on the phone with you in, in the evenings. I am so is glad you're bringing that up. You line. want to put on the boxing gloves? Hold it, hold it, hold it. Hold it. Wait, who started this? Who brought this are, up? I should be able to re respond. We are, we are talking about the election or the nomination of vice chair of Jack Garamendi, and that's what we are going to discuss. Why would a supervisor, why would a supervisor say that I spoke with his wife, who was an IHSS board member, which I am on the board, which our oversight okay. boss doesn't come see. We, we are discussing Jack Garamendi's nomination Why for chair. Why would your I cannot board member I, speak I cannot, to me in that manner? I, I cannot address okay. that. You can't, because it's called the lack of professional bill, okay. professionalism. We are discussing Jack Garamendi vice chair. That's what we're discussing. If you, I'm if discussing. You if you can't go forward on that, and we can't go forward I'm on going that. Forward on, I'm going forward on whoever's chair needs to represent the entire county. And I have emailed and called you, and you have not called me back. Thank you. So I really hope that I will be hearing from you. Thank you. The only thing I wanted to say is... Whoa! Whoa! Oh, 
stop. stop. You, you, can, you, you need to get in line and, and come up and talk. Yeah. No. Yeah. You, you've got to learn to be nice. And uh, sometimes it's hard. Uh, both uh, Gary and Jack are good supervisors. Uh, and occasionally I agree with them. Uh, it, it, does, it does make sense that, uh, that Jack would be appointed vice chair. Uh, and that'll bring uh, the process of balance. Uh, also, the question was raised several times about not getting response from uh, supervisors when you communicate with them. And I don't know if many people know this, but you can go on record, send an email to your supervisor, but go through the clerk of the board. It then becomes official correspondence. No supervisor is going to ignore you then, because you're now on record. Thank you. You, you need to come to the microphone, please. Okay, mine was not to make another statement except for I have a... I'm, I think there's some confusion here. I don't think that anyone is removing a supervisor. It just, just has to do with being vice chair or chair. As far as being represented, people represented in District 2, for instance, will not, you're not going to stop representing them, I assume. So the question, so the thing is, I don't think it has anything to do with District 2 being the sup their supervisor. It just has to, this is, like you said, a nomination or an election for a vice chair. Thank you. Ms. Marty, you've already spoken. I know, this is the point of order. What's your point of order? I think we've missed the idea of the point of order that was brought up. Um, you didn't actually hear the point of order. The point of order, I believe, was that this is public comment, and we all know that sometimes people coming forth to speak in public comment want you to respond and you always say this is public comment we can't respond but we just witnessed a supervisor attacking or responding however responding, you want to call no it attack. And, well and it felt your, like your that point, on your that point of order is so and i think that you it is your job as chair to address that thank you next anybody else I talked to quite a few people um, occasionally, and I've talked to a lot of people in District 2, and they are afraid to come out and say how they feel about the pot growing and their supervisor and his pro-pot stance. And um, what more can you say about your constituency being afraid? Any other public comment? I'm really just going to follow up on what Marty had said. Um, I also had the point of order, and it was Rule 24 that she's referring to, the commitment to civility, and it specifically states that we need to recognize it is sometimes difficult to speak at board meetings, and out of respect for each person's feelings, allow them to have their say without comment. That's been the norm in this board chambers over the last year, and I just hope that it continues to be uh, going into 2018. Thank you. Bonnie Newman, District 1. Um, I support Jack Uramendi's nomination for vice chair. Um, I support his nomination for chair also. And as I said before, I think a cabal has formed here, a group of secret plotters and schemers that conspire and collude to promote their own agenda, whoever they've made promises to. And I think it's sad that you do that in front of all these people, in front of the TV, and expose yourself for being biased 
and unfair. And I think Mr. Garamendi will do a great job as vice chair. Um, Gary Toffinelli is my supervisor, and I have all the confidence in the world in him. I like him as a man, and I like him as a supervisor. He did more research on the pot issue than all the rest you combined, I think. I think, in fairness, you need to rotate leadership. Otherwise, you look like a bunch of colluders, conspirators, crooks. Thank you. Vicki Ranke, Angels Camp. Um, this may be a point of clarification that I had to get up and say something. The people who are coming to this microphone act like they have the only opinion in this county and that they are the only ones who support our Board of Supervisors. I just want you to know, for clarification, that is not true. We have a lot of people in our community who support Mills, Clapp, Tofanelli on their positions on items. Thank, Thank you. you. Any other public comment? This is Abigail Guthrie. She wants 10 seconds of your time of silence. She does have an opinion. She does not have a voice. Thank you. Any other public comment? Seeing none, I'll bring it back to the board. Any other board comments? I have, a, <clears throat> I have a few comments. Last year when we first got this board started is we picked chair and vice chair the same way we did this time. So District 5 has been passed over. So I know you're not really wanting me to be chair. I would not take chair anyway because I'm in the process of re-election. So I will be busy. I think Jack Garamendi is in the process of recall. Uh, we pick, we, I pick from who I think will be best to serve the district. I think Gary is the far qualified person for the first of the year, which I voted no against Mike because I thought Gary would have been much better. It was a cabbage then, what happened. And I reason why I wanted Gary, because Gary's been chair for a year and he's been a previous member for four years. And when we started out the year here, you had four new supervisors that never served on the board. And I never heard the outrage come from any of these people out here right now. This is just strictly people's upset because Jack's a supporter of pot and you guys didn't get it. It has nothing to do with pot at all. This is how we run. Order, please, order. Or we're gonna ask you to leave the room. The supervisor is speaking now. George, I'll have you removed. In the last year, we have no, had no rules and procedures of the board, which is, was ridiculous, and we still have no rules and, rules and procedures of the board. It's been ran just like when Edson used to run it. It was by the chair, and they made it as they went. Now, hopefully this time, we'll have rules and procedures of the board where everybody knows what the rules and procedures are. It's like now, right, the last three years in this board, it's been like a poker game, and the chair's made up the rules as it went, and it's time to quit. Any other board comments? I do that. Supervisor Clapp, you're incorrect. There are rules. We follow those rules. You should have a copy in that desk right in front of you. The reference made by public comment of Rule 24, mm -hmm. the public knows those rules. We have conducted this board adjacent to those rules and abide by them. So that's an incorrect statement, Mr. Clapp. And I'm gonna be upfront. I have been your last board chair and I have ruled in accordance with those rules. I just want a point of clarification, Mr. Chair. Supervisor Mills, your light's on, you got some comment? Uh, only to, before we go into public comment, at the beginning of public comment, I would ask that a specific rule be read into the record <clears throat> and uh, that would be my comment for now, only just to matter procedure. Okay. If that's all the board comments, um, I'll call for the vote. 
I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. no. Uh, three, two. Jack Garamendi is vice chair. We will take a 15 minute break. I'm sorry, before we break, can you please clarify it? I heard Supervisor Clapp vote no. You voted no as well? Thank you. We will take a 15 minute break. Madam Clerk. Recognition and acknowledgements. Item six is from Public Health Services to adopt a proclamation honoring Linda Wynn for over 13 years of service to the residents of Calaveras County in the Health and Human Services Public Health Division and congratulating her on her retirement. Supervisor Mills. Yes, this is a proclamation recognizing Linda Wynn's 13 years of service as part of the Public Health and Human Services Agency, Public Health Division, and congratulating her on her retirement. Whereas Ms. Wynn began her career at the Health and Human Services Agency Public Health Division on May 29th of 2004, and whereas Ms. Wynn has served as Public Health Nurse 2, Public Health Nurse 3, Director of Public Health Nursing, and Public Health Manager at the Health and Human Services Agency Public Health Division, and whereas Ms. Wynn has selflessly dedicated her career in service to the residents of Calaveras County, and whereas Ms. Wynn has consistently been supportive of the staff, provided words of encouragement, and viewed problems as opportunities while taking every chance to coach them. And I would ask for a motion. So moved. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. Let's go to public comment. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board. Kristen Brinks, Health and Human Services. Um, last minute. Uh, Last minute change, Ms. Wynn has to care for an ill family, family member, but um, on behalf of Health and Human Services, we just wanted to recognize her exceptional leadership of the Public Health Department and again, wish her very well and we thank you very much for recognizing her today. Will you be accepting her proclamation in her absence then? Uh, yes, I can do that. Thank you. Any other public comment? Good morning, Terry Lane. Executive Director for Spive Calaveras, and I am sorry that Linda could not be here today to get your well wishes and your gratitude. She has been a big part of First Five, as she has been a commissioner um, the last four years, and has always brought professionalism and updates from the county on what's happening um, in the health area. I also serve on the Calaveras Child Care Council and the Calaveras Dental Task Force, and Linda has been a huge part of both of those as well. And I'm happy to say that she has um, dedicated herself to continue with the task force and the Child Care Council even after her retirement, which is just a huge bonus for Calaveras. So thank you for acknowledging her today. Any other public comments? If not, I'll bring it back to the board. Any other discussion with the board? If not, I'll call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Now, now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the Board of Supervisors, County of Calaveras, this ninth day of January 2018, do hereby honor and recognize Linda Wynn for her years of service and express their appreciation to Ms. Wynn for her loyalty and leadership to the County of Calaveras, and wish, wish her much happiness as she begins her, this new chapter in her life, passed and adopted by the Board of Supervisors of the County of Calaveras, State of California, this ninth day of January, 2018. Ms. Spring. Item seven is from the Board of Supervisors to proclaim January 2018 as National Mentoring Month 
and January 25th as Thank Your Mentor Day in Calaveras County. Supervisor Oliveira. Thank you, Board Chair. This is a proclamation uh, proclamating January as National Mentor Month and January 25th, 2018 as Thank Your Mentor Day. Whereas the future of Calaveras County rests on the hopes and dreams of its children and youth. And whereas mentors provide valuable role models for our youth. And whereas relationships with caring mentors offer youth valuable support, friendship, and guidance towards making healthy life decisions. And whereas research has shown that mentored youth are, youth are less likely to skip school, less likely to start using drugs, and less likely to start drinking and whereas. Strong mentoring programs that are supported by the entire community are more visible and therefore more successful and whereas. The Calaveras County Office of Education provides award-winning mentoring programs that serve more than 75 students and young adults every school year and whereas. There are many Calaveras youth waiting for mentors and whereas. National Mentoring Month provides an opportunity to recognize and commend the efforts of mentors and raise community awareness of the importance of mentoring. At this time, I would entertain a motion, Mr. Chair, to accept this proclamation, or you can, sir. So moved. Do I have a second? I'll second it. We have a second by Supervisor Mills. Um, before the vote, we have public comment. I really want the first. I do. <laughs> um, Marty Crane. Um, I always remember back at the library in, um, I forget where we were, oh, here in San Andreas, our very first youth mentoring meeting to talk about, this is a cool idea, we should do this. And I'm so impressed with what Catherine and the whole team and. The, now the County Office of Education has brought forward and, and created and the impact individually on each and every child and then their impact on others as they move forward. But I also want us to remember that we all, all have mentors all throughout our lives. Um, there was a woman that worked for Ma Bell in LA. I don't know her name, but she was a mentor to me like no one, I mean, I was, it was a time in my life when I needed a mentor, and there she was. Um, uh, Doris Custer, a um, lovely woman uh, who was a founding member of the Volunteer Center Board, fabulous mentor of mine. Um, President Barack Obama, Michelle Obama, amazing mentors to me. Um, I had this whole string of them in my head, and now they're all around me, and I'm having trouble pulling their names. But I will say also that the charming husband has been my mentor for many, many years. And um, I know that when I sit down, I'm going to go, oh, I remember. And I want to say their names, but I don't have them. But we all have mentors everywhere, forever where we go. Steve Walensky was a good mentor of mine for many years. and. Um, I watch all of you and I look for the good things and try to uh, glean from those. And so that makes us who we are and makes us more uh, prepared to be a better mentor for our youth in the youth mentoring program. So honor all your mentors today. Thank you. Hello, I'm Katie Lackler. And um, I'd like to just take a second to um, ask if everybody here who's here to support mentoring could just stand up for a second. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> awesome. That is awesome. According to a national study by Big Brothers Big Sisters, at-risk youth with a mentor are 52% less likely than their peers to skip a day of school. They're 55% more likely to be enrolled in college and 46% less likely to, than their peers to start using drugs. 
But at its core, mentoring guarantees young people that there is someone who cares about them, sees them for their strengths, and assures them that they are not alone. We are here to ask you to recognize January as National Mentoring Month in Calaveras County. This is the largest scale mentoring campaign nationwide. It is an opportunity to connect more young people with caring adults and to recognize the mentoring relationships that form and thrive every day. My name is Katie Lackler and I'm the coordinator for the Calaveras Youth Mentoring Program, a best practices program that connects local youth with safe, positive mentors who offer friendship, opportunity, and support for making healthy life decisions. The mentoring program currently has 26 matches and a waiting list of approximately 10 eager boys and girls. We fully screen, monitor, and support our volunteer mentors and mentees and provide training, field trips, and mentor counsel. Volunteer mentors spend a few hours every week for at least one year with their mentee, having fun and building a friendship. In January, in addition to National Mentoring Month, the Calaveras Youth Mentoring Program will celebrate its 15th 15th anniversary since its creation in 2003. In that time, the mentoring program has made 157 matches and sustained an incredible 84% success rate. This means that 84% of our matches make it to one year, a testament to a program structure that prioritizes time spent building and sustaining strong friendships made to endure. Calaveras Youth Mentoring Program evaluation data also consistently shows the benefits of mentoring on a young person's life. To name a few, over time, a student with a mentor improves in the areas of self-esteem, ability to build trusting relationships with adults, and outlook on his or her own future. National Mentoring Month also celebrates our FNL Mentoring Program, which connects high school mentors with middle school protégés, and is now in its 10th year in Calaveras schools. More than 500 students have participated in FNL Mentoring over the years. June McTeer, who's not able to join us today, is a coordinator for the FNL Mentoring Program in Calaveras County. Our cohort of mentoring programs is joined by Students with a Goal, or SWAG, Young Adult Mentoring Program. This is a new mentoring program specifically for youth ages 16 to 21. The mission of SWAG is to connect young adults with mentors who offer friendship, experience, and resources to help them develop greater self-awareness and experience a smoother road to adulthood. The SWAG program is a natural addition to the mentoring programs offered in Calaveras, contributing to a community culture where mentoring starts young and becomes a natural resource through each person's life and phases of growth. Christina, this is Christina Smith, hello, um, the new coordinator for the SWAG program. She currently has eight volunteer mentors and 11 young people enrolled or in the enrollment process, making for very vibrant monthly gatherings with topics ranging from, ranging from money management to self-care. As you know, we are fortunate in Calaveras County to have some pretty amazing kids. Kids who believe in friendship, connection, and their futures. Kids who face life's challenges with strength, resilience, creativity, and hope. Kids who are willing to invite a safe adult into their lives, who believes in them and wants to invest in their greatness. Your proclamation today describes the need for more mentors. Every youth who wants a mentor should have one but not every per young person gets one. There are currently 10 boys and girls throughout Calaveras County waiting for a mentor with an even longer um, list of youth interested in applying for the program. And so I have a, a list here of our young people who are waiting, so I can leave that outside. If you would all refer to it, and if you know somebody who would make a good mentor for one of these young people, I'd really appreciate a call or an email. Um, can, we, can we give one copy to the clerk? Yes. Thanks to strong, enduring community guidance and generosity, the Calaveras Mentoring Foundation has successfully supported our mentoring programs financially every year since the foundation was formed in 2010. This year, we are introducing a newly redesigned website and a new mentoring program poster. There are many ways you can support mentoring in Calaveras County. One of the best ways is to talk to your friends about mentoring. Suggest to someone they might make a good mentor, like us on Facebook and share our posts, make a financial gift or host, one of our program representatives to speak at a community <coughs> organization. Thank you and happy National Mentoring Month. Any other public comments, staff comments? Hi, Sam Leach, Chief Probation Officer. Um, I, when I uh, took the job four years ago, uh, one of the things I was lucky enough to get approached by was uh, Catherine Eustace 
who asked if I would sit on the uh, Calaveras Youth Mentoring Advisory Committee. And um, it, I've become very attached to them, and they're really a bright spot in my month. Uh, I, so I just wanted to come up and, and just very simple support of saying, you know, every kid who gets arrested, everybody under the age of 18 who gets arrested in Calaveras County, um, those police reports come to probation. And we review those and we work with the district attorney and, and we choose whether to file or not. Um, there are a lot of kids who never come to me who were at risk. And one of the biggest reasons for that is, is the work of Catherine and, and Katie and Christina. I mean, they're, they're just doing amazing work and uh, one of the best um, mentoring programs, I believe, in the state. So we're lucky to have them and um, just very happy that they're being recognized. And, um, just wanted to say that. I should probably say something. But Katie did a great job, didn't she? And I think after all of the years of Colleen and watching her grow into the job, I don't know if you all are aware, but Colleen has gone on to graduate school to become an occupational therapist. And one of the first things that she wrote to me when she started her program was, Catherine, you're not going to believe this, but occupational therapy is mentoring. And she's viewing that her experience as a mentoring program coordinator as the perfect launching pad for her career as an occupational therapist. I'm sure we'll have her back here as another quality contribution to our educational program in the next couple of years. But I'm, as you can see, a very proud mentor now myself of several young people who are helping us grow our mentoring programs in Calaveras County. And I hope that you will continue to support and watch their growth as young professionals because I couldn't be prouder. Thank you. Any other public comments? If not, we'll bring it back to the board. Any comments by board members? If not, I'll call for a vote. I have a motion and a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes by zero. Supervisor Oliveira. Thank you. Now, therefore, it's being proclaimed that the Board of Supervisors, Calaveras County, hereby declares January 2018 as National Mentoring Month and January 25th, 2018 as Thank Your Mentor Day. Passed and adopted this 9 day of January 2018 by the Board of Supervisors of Cal Barris County. Come on, everybody. <laughs> We're going to go on to the next agenda item. It's public comment period. Uh, before we do that, um, Madam Clerk, um, can you um, please read the public comment statement and um, the other statement? Yes, Mr. Chair. Public comment. Any item of interest to the public that is within the subject matter jurisdiction of the board and is not posted on the consent or regular agendas may be addressed during the public comment period. California law prohibits the board from taking action on any matter which is not posted on the agenda unless it is determined to be an emergency by the Board of Supervisors. If public comment is completed before the 30-minute allotted time period, 
the board may immediately move to the next order of business. If public comment is not completed during the allotted time period, it will be continued as the last item of business in order to provide an opportunity for the remainder of comments to be heard. Rule 46, orderly conduct. Each person who addresses the board shall not make personal, impertinent, slanderous, or profane remarks to any member of the board, staff, or general public. Any person who makes such remarks or who utters loud, threatening, personal, or abusive language or engages in any other disorderly conduct which disrupts, disturbs, or otherwise impedes the orderly conduct of any board meeting shall at the discretion of the board or a majority of the board be barred from further audience before the board during that board meeting. Government Code Section 54957.9. Yeah, I want to make it perfectly clear that we're going to be civil here today. Um, and I know there was a motion, motions earlier today, but let's try and keep, we're all adults here, let's try and keep them under control. You have the right to speak on any agenda, anything that you wish to speak on that's not on the agenda. If you want to speak about when you come up, speak about anything on the agenda, you'll have to wait until that comes up, that item comes up. So. Thank you, Supervisor. Bonnie Newman from Double Springs. Um, this year, I got from Santa Claus a new dictionary. It's 20 years newer than the one I've been using, so I'm not sure I'm going to learn any new words, but this is my attempt to keep from losing my old words. Um, I had a resolution this year, but I said, no, resolutions are to be broken. I'm going to state my intentions. No more Mr. Nice Guy for me. I'm going to speak out when I see or think something's wrong. And I'm going to talk about first a Brown Act violation. It's when a majority of the board has any interaction or contact regarding an issue that is to be discussed on the agenda. This is my new um, basis for my new words, and I have four words today. The first one is sycophant, a self-seeking, servile flatterer, a fawning parasite, a yes man, and a toady, obsequious, showing servile compliance or deference. Servile means slavishly submissive, following or obeying without question. When I learned that word first in 1968, I interpreted it as being a butt kisser. My second word is hypocrite. I've defined that word before, but I think it needs repeating. And I have a new definition from my dictionary. One who pretends to have virtues, moral, or religious beliefs and principles that he or she does not actually possess, especially a person whose actions belie their stated beliefs. A person who feigns some desirable or publicly approved attitude whose private life, opinions, or statements prove otherwise. For me, in my simple terms, I define that as being a phony. Now, I'm bringing up these terms because the news often inspires me to look up words. Um, we've seen at the national level a bunch of sycophants and a bunch of hypocrites. I hope I don't see that in this room the next year um, because I get really frustrated. Um, I'm 70 this year and I have hot flashes. I stay up all night stressing about things and I do not intend to let anything go by that I feel I need to speak out on. Thank you. Hi, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, board. Thank you for your service, Olivera, and congratulations to you, too. Uh, I'm Danielle from Avery. Uh, my son, JJ, uh, he goes to Bret Hart. 
Um, I'm here today because I got a letter in the mail. My premiums went up 28%. I went from 145 a month to now 556 a month. That's not being his mother, that's just being a worker in this community. I'm right above the federal poverty level where I cannot receive any help. I can also not claim him on my, when I go into the welfare department to maybe get some help for secondary insurance because he's considered his own person. So I am a single woman walking in there with his monies. Um, I have over $20,000 in bills through ER that's just flus. That's not nothing here. I stand before you today uninsured. Last time I was insured. I have a few days to make a moment, to make a choice in that moment whether I want to give more than a third of my income now so I can have quality care and some kind of security. I go to the Angels Camp Clinic for my care and I go down to Stockton and San Andreas for my cardiac. The doctors there seen my dire need and they rushed me into surgery and got me my heart clearance, got me my heart monitors, my echo, my treadmill and everything before the end of the year knowing that my premiums are going to raise. Those are our heroes that are fighting behind the battles right now. These are the guys and men and women that are dealing with the tragedies of these numbers. Numbers just don't add up. I cannot afford that kind of insurance, I barely could afford the little that I have. Tomorrow will be two weeks that I had surgery. These are some pictures of my surgery. It's very well needed. I'm behind on my current medical because I cannot afford it. As a mother and a worker in in-home support services, I moved up here and I did not realize that the SEIU and the county and their dynamics. I am here to make a hard choice whether I go back to a cash paying patient, which I get discounts and I get to pick and choose. And sometimes it comes down to food or this uh, blood draw or this uh, doctor. Um, I'm looking to you guys to make, you guys have the power. Um, it's one thing to be unaware, but it's another thing to be aware and not do anything about it. Um, I am a member in your community and I'm asking for your guys' help. Thank you. Good morning, Marty Crane. Um, so we're welcoming in 2018 and I'd like to say, let's all try to be and do better. Um, so speaking to we the public and those we elect and hire to attend to the day-to-day -day operations of this wonderful place that we all call home. Um, Bonnie said that we can't call these resolutions, so I think we should uh, form some new intentions. Uh, let's consider that we promise ourselves to keep an open mind and remain aware that our individual opinions will likely not be totally in line with others. Finding areas of common ground can only come from continued conversations and a willingness to listen and compromise. That goes both sides of the podium. Uh, let's remember that we hire people through an election process to listen, gather, and process all the information and work through and with the board. At this point, it must be said that manipulating the processes is not working within and through the board. It must be said that encouraging the public to join the recall to eliminate a board member who holds differing opinions is not working with and through the board. It must also be said that undermining the board's um, planned time for deliberation by suddenly presenting a separate privately prepared draft, draft environmental impact report is not working with and through the board. And also, failure to acknowledge and act on the fiscal instability of our county is not working with and through the board. So let's promise ourselves that we will actually interview the upcoming candidates like we would for any other critically important position in charge of overseeing the business and uh, for setting the policies for Calaveras County. Um, 
we can't continue to do what we've been doing in the past and expect us to do better. So thank you. Any other public comments? The sheriff has already been here this morning explaining his difficulty in retaining his staff because of financial considerations. The prices in Arnold or for houses, for rent, for whatever else um, are high. They're also high in the rest of Calaveras County. And um, it's going to get to the point that the marijuana industry will be the only people who can afford to be in Calaveras County. Obviously, the sheriff, the deputy sheriffs can't afford to be here because they're leaving. The imbalance of the finances will impact every facet of Calaveras County. And I hope you guys take that into consideration for, you know, what happens tomorrow. Um, in the meantime, my uh, Toyon has been blooming and um, it has a, a crop on it that's getting very ripe. And I have about 100 robins that usually visit me every year. And they have not come. And uh, I'm concerned. I don't know what's happened to them. Uh, I also am concerned about um, California burning up at such a huge amount. I can't believe that uh, they just wait until the fire gets to the house and then quench it so it doesn't burn the house down. There is something very, very wrong in California that this is happening. It is not just because of the drought. But if it is because of the drought, in, um, for instance, Kenya, when people take part of the rainforest and um, harvest it, um, the Sahara Desert um, takes in more of the land in a direct proportion to what has been harvested. And I think we should take that into consideration. When we start um, allowing our vegetation to burn up, thank you. Al Sagala, Taxpayer Association. Um, got several items. Uh, the most important is our um, this this bad gas tax uh, SB one. Uh, we have today's the last day to sign a petition to try to get this on the ballot for repeal. I'll have at, at lunchtime. I'll have petitions in the lobby. If anybody wants to sign, that'd be a good time. You have to be a registered voter in, uh, in this county. Uh, now, along with that, I discovered a rumor that uh, originally there was $860,000 that was set, uh, set up for our county to receive funds to repair our roads from this source, from this uh, SB1. But what actually was received was uh, about $400,000. I think what we need to do is get some sunshine on this, find out where the missing money went, and make this public. And I would recommend that uh, that the uh, maybe the county CAO uh, investigate this and find out what's going on. Um, also, another item is sheriff uh, pay for sheriff deputies. Um, previously. Uh, our taxpayer association actually uh, su suggested that we tax ourselves more, which is unheard of for taxpayers organizations. But when you think of the reason for salaries for, for public officials or anybody else is to attract the best and keep the best people you can. If you have a, uh, a salary structure that, that doesn't do that, actually destroys the, uh, the the integrity of the organization, such as the sheriff's department, 
you need to take serious condition, the serious attention to this and correct those conditions. And I think this needs to be done quickly. And, and so uh, we concur with the sheriff in pointing out why some of these officers are leaving. And, uh, and here again, this needs to be done under sunshine. And I, that, I, that's enough for now. Thank you. Any other public comments? George Fry, I want to apologize because I'm so passionate, very passionate about having good leaders. And I'm passionate about things being uh, done right. I guess it comes from uh, being in law enforcement for so many years that um, there's a right way and there's a wrong way. And sometimes I think the board takes uh, the latter course and it's disappointing to me because I am so passionate. I'm passionate about veterans too. And I will be speaking to the chair sometime today to do something about the problem with the Veterans Memorial Hall in Valley Springs. I finally found the Veterans Act of California that says any veterans organization can use that building free of charge. And Mr. Uh, Finelli, who has been on that board, is going to help me. He may want to do it reluctantly, or he may want to do it in real support of veterans. Michael, I want to thank you for being the board chair this past year. I have never seen meetings run as well as when you have ran the meetings. Uh, you treat people with respect, you listen to people, you are sincere, you uh, care about people, and it shows. Thank you. Jack, I'm still fighting the battle. Even though District 1 has had the chair for of the last five years, I'm hoping that next year you will be the chair, that these people will finally figure it out. One of the other nice things is, is there are some other people that are running, and I'm going to support them because there are some people on this board that I am not impressed with at all. You may think I'm some country bumpkin that just fell off the turnip truck. I'm not, and I'll keep speaking up. Thank you. Any other public comments? May I submit something? Proponent Randall Smith, District 3. Uh, first of all, thank you, Mike. Uh, you've been a fabulous chair. Uh, I really appreciate your service. Uh, congratulations to Jack and Gary uh, for your, your elections today. Um, uh, what I just what I'm sharing with you now is that today in Sacramento is the first of seven public uh, meetings on the state track and trace system. There's going to be, like I said, seven of these. The first one, there's one going on right now, and another one at one o'clock in Sacramento. You'll see the other meetings, Fresno, uh, the, San, the Bay Area. Plenty of opportunities for people to learn about track and trace, not just online, but by going to these meetings. Um, and of course, it's important for the decision you're going to make tomorrow. So I just wanted to let you know about that. I'm off to Sacramento to learn, because that's what I do. I hopefully, that's what we're all doing up here. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment? Hi, it's Megan Guthrie again. I also want to acknowledge Michael, um, Mr. Oliveira for this past year. I think you have done a fabulous job. Um, I just want to really kind of just review last year and speak to last year. Um, 
our family has been out of this co county for 13 years. My daughter, when she was five years old, was placed out of state. We've always been a Calaveras County resident. And we were placed out of state due to her disabilities and the school district wanting us out of state. We fought really hard for her to come back to high school. It isn't going so well. We've had a tough year this year. And you know what? There's a lot more going on than just my marijuana. And to complicate things more, my daughter is on CBD oil, and she needs it. And without it, she might not be here very long. So that's not going so well either. And I've reached out to all the board members, and I have tried to talk to you about a plethora of issues, not just CBD oil. That is like one little speck and grain of sand of my, in my life. In fact, 90 days ago, my daughter was an organ failure. Look at her today. And we could have lost her. And CBD actually is a big contributing factor of why she's in this courtroom today, or um, chambers today. But I just hope next year going forward is better, because I know right now it's 11 o'clock. She should be in school. And everyone should be asking themselves, why is Abigail not in school? And what's going on with special education? And it's mentor month. And boy, I wish she had a mentor. Not only do I wish she had a mentor, I wish she had a school program to go to. So this county has a lot of issues going on, and there's more issues than just pot. And even with the issues of pot, it takes taxes and regulation, and it takes things to clean up the pot. So you know what? I see both sides to all of the coins and everything going on here. But if you don't have budgets and you don't have money, and I know this kid right here, you're talking about possibly putting in another out-of-county placement, you might want to reconsider your budgets. Because this kid alone, she could have built you a new school. But we don't understand why she's not going to school. So I just hope this is a better year and there's more understanding and that not all discussions revolve around marijuana. And we need an economy, we need budgets, we need taxes, we need awareness of what's going on in this district. We need care. We have elderly, we have the elderly, we have disabled. Um, the IHSS board, we don't even have a quorum right now because of, of paperwork and just, just malfunctions in our county, the way we run things. So I just hope for a more or organized year. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Any other public comments? If not, we'll close public comments and we'll go on to the next agenda item. Consent agenda, Madam Clerk. Consent agenda. Consent agenda items are expected to be routine and non-controversial. They will be acted upon by the board at one time without discussion. Any board member, staff member, or interested party may request the removal of an item from the consent agenda for later discussion. Does any board member wish to pull any item from consent? I Supervisor. Like pull member, um, I, I didn't like to do this, but I'd like to pull uh, 18. 18. Supervisor Garamendi. Um, I will be pulling item number 20. Any member of staff wish to pull? Yes, Kristen. Number 10. Number 10. Any other member of staff? Um, yes, I've had a request to pull item 24. Any member of the public wish to pull anything off consent? Number 15. Number 15. Any other? Okay, if not, uh, I would uh, entertain a motion for the remainder of the consent agenda. Mr. Chair, I move the remainder. I have a motion by Supervisor Mills. Second. Uh, second by Oliveira. Any further discussion? If not, is there any public comments on any of the consent agenda items that have not been pulled? I didn't, I didn't move quickly enough. I'd like to have item number 17 pulled. 
All right, we will move. We will have item 17 moved. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I'll amend mo my motion. Mr. Chair, I'll amend my second to include item 17. Okay. Any other public comment? If not, bring it back for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Moving on to item number 10. Madam Clerk. Item 10 is from the Health and Human Services Agency to authorize the board chair to execute an agreement with Five Claw Maintenance for janitorial services in the Human Services Building located at 509 East St. Charles Street, San Andreas in an amount not to exceed $80,900 during the period of October 1st, 2017 through September 30th, 2018. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Kristen Brinks, Health and Human Services. Um, I am asking that the board pull this item and consider it at a later date uh, per direction from Human Resources, uh, who needs time to meet and confer with the union. Um, this information was brought to light uh, very last minute, and um, it is not in, in past practice. We've always kind of operated like this, but this is something that Human Resources wishes to discuss a little further. So I respectfully request you to remove this item and consider it at a later date. Any public comments? If not, we'll bring it to the board. Um, Mr. Chair, comments? I so move. Your, your motion is to move to uh, remove it from the, our agenda and move it to a later date? That is correct. Do I have a second? I second it. I have a motion and a second. Any comments? If not, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? So be it. Move to another date. For clarification purposes, this item is is uh, moved to a not a date certain. It's not a date to certain. a future meeting at another time. Whenever Kristen. Unspecified. Yes. Thank you. Item number 15. This was pulled by Bonnie, Madam Clerk. <coughs> Item number 15 is from Public Health Services to authorize the board chair to sign an agreement with Denise Cintron Perales for the provision of evaluation services as mandated for the tobacco, tobacco control program in an amount not to exceed $116,000 for a period of July 1, 2017 through June 30th, 2021. Bonnie. Good morning. Um, I'm assuming this is uh, prevention of tobacco use to keep people from becoming tobacco smokers. Now we know that the dangers of first-hand to cigarette smoking. We've heard about the dangers of second-hand smoke, which is uh, breathing someone else's cigarettes. I've just recently been made aware of third-hand smoke and the danger of that. And it entails people that smoke cigarettes have it on their clothes, their hands, their body, and they become in con they come in contact with other people. Um, babies have been uh, tested and have shown signs of nicotine in their system. Now I'm almost 70, and in all my years I've only ever met two people who washed their hands after they smoked a cigarette. Uh, one of them was a lady that ran the nursery up in Pine Grove, and she refused to allow people smoking cigarettes in her nursery because nicotine affects the buds on uh, vegetable plants. The second person that washed her hands after smoking was a care provider that came into my home and cared for my loved one. And I noticed that she washed her hands every time she came inside from smoking a cigarette on her break. And she told me, I don't dare touch a client with my hands because I know they stink and I know that they probably don't enjoy it. I didn't know that nicotine transferred just by touch and your body has pores, I guess it's called osmosis, I'm not even sure that's the right word, that your body can absorb things through the skin. So I'm wondering if this uh, tobacco control program addresses all three of those kinds of cigarette smoking and especially creating awareness about third-hand smoke, which I've just been made aware of. Thank you. Good 
morning, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Kristen Brinks, Health and Human Services. Um, to address Ms. Newman's points, uh, this is a program, the tobacco prevention program is very well established through the California Department of Public Health. It fi follows science-based um, research and science-based education and addresses all of the newest and up-to-date um, science-based services. And it is heavily, um, it is a well-respected program. It is uh, one that really does focus on prevention and prevention services. Um, so I guess yes to all of her questions. I'm curious about the um, the, ex the expense, $116,000. To me, that's a lot of money. I would I would like to know, does that money come out of out of the general fund, or where does it come from? Kristen Brinks, Health and Human Services. Um, to address Mr. Fry's points, it is a four-year contract. So it's $116,000 over a four-year period. That comes out to approximately $29,000 annually. Uh, and it is, um, we utilize, work with a vendor who is approved by the state. We are limited to the number of individuals that we can work with. Um, and it is not general fund. This is funding that comes from the California Department of Public Health. As you know, the Health and Human Services Agency has very, very minimal general fund as part of our budget. And this is a um, funding source that comes from Department of Public Health state. Chair, I do have a question. Bonnie, was your question answered? Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Other public comments? Oh. My parents are gone, but I love them very much. They were wonderful parents. They were human beings, and they made mistakes. And, um, but they smoked. And uh, my mom's surgeon said, um, when she was being examined by her surgeon, that uh, she wondered what could have caused her aortic aneurysm. And uh, he says, he poked her belly and he says, uh, smoking. And it's true because she felt very guilty about her habit, but if you were going in the bathroom when she was coming out, it was uh, pretty difficult to breathe. But uh, I just kind of wonder, um, people talk about cigarette smoking, but my parents were engaged with their brain when they were taking care of me. What about all these people that are smoking marijuana? Any other public comments? If not, close public comments. Um, I had a couple questions on this. I'd sent some emails out and Kristen was um, responded to them along with Tim um, concerning indemnity and the insurance portion of it. And my concerns were met through Kristen. Um, I want to make sure though that this, this vendor, this contractor does not sublet any of this work out without us vet, uh, vetting the person that she's going to vet out to that she's going to let out too, and that they are covered under insurance. Understood. Um, yes, Dennis. Yes, I had a question, uh, and I probably should have sent you an email on it, because again, <clears throat> you're folding these funds into the same line item in the budget as your other tobacco funds, so this it's simply going to be added into that line item? Uh, it's part of our budget. We And this is ongoing funding for many years, and so this was built into the budget that um, for the year that we're currently in. Okay, just wanted to be sure. Thank you. Any other questions from the board? If not, I'll entertain a motion. So moved. Second. A motion by Supervisor Garamendi. I'll second. Second by Supervisor Mills. Any other comment? Call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> Passes 5-0. Moving on to the next item. Item number 17, this has to do with the library. George, you pulled this item. Yes, sir. Sorry, item I'm 17 sorry. is from the library. It's to accept the $90,000 grant from the California State Library on behalf of the Calaveras County Library for the installation of high-speed broadband internet in the central library and four branch libraries 
and approve the budget adjustment which accounts for the use of this grant. This action requires a four-fifths vote of the board. I pulled this item not because I don't think there's anything wrong with it. There isn't. This lady who was approved as an appointment as the librarian for Calaveras County, I just want people to know what an outstanding job she continues to do. And I'm really excited about the, the high speed internet. Thank you. No questions then. No, I don't have any questions. Is there any other public comment? Any other public comment on this item? If not, I'll bring it back to the board. Um, any board comments? If not, I'll look for a motion. So moved, Supervisor. I'm sorry. So moved, Chairman. I move motion by Supervisor Oliveira. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Supervisor Clapp. Call for the vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5 0. Moving on to item number 18, uh, Madam Chair, this was pulled by Supervisor Garamendi. Item 18 is from County Council to adopt a resolution authorizing the initiation of litigation for the collection of unpaid administrative fines related to illegal cannabis cultivation citations. Good morning, uh, Chair Tofanelli and the board. Uh, this is just a, a take further action for collections to give general authorization to county council for administrative fines as this fiscal year and last fiscal year that accumulated to about 912 but a correction on that 912,000 there's about 20,000 less I think it's 552 plus 339 so that's what we're here for and if you have any questions sure you have thank you very much um, Ed. Um, what is the uh, in addition to the cannabis fines that you put in the in the staff memo, what are the general code violations? How much how much money are in are outstanding in those accounts as well? Yes, we we did some research on that because uh, we knew that we we're going to have that. We have the information. We have about four hundred seventy thousand outstanding from two thousand fourteen two thousand seventeen. Uh, to give exact numbers, there are a lot less uh, citations because it's a different type of uh, citation. We had probably about thirty five and two. 2014, 2015, we had 51. And those two years, we had about 800 some thousand. 2016, we had 12 citations. And in 2017, we had, uh, you've got to scratch out, about 24. Uh, the last fiscal year or so, out of that total uh, 92,000, we had probably over a little million dollars of citation fines. But 470,000 still outstanding on the code side also, which will probably come further for action on those in the future. The, uh, the resolution in our packet <clears throat> specifically says cannabis. Um, I assume that you're seeking authorization to pursue all claims, uh, not just cannabis, but all outstanding um, code violations, correct? Uh, I guess this one's more specific for the cannabis, but I guess it would be general in, in, in a sense, yes, general authorization for county council. But I guess it can be made council. Maybe county council. I would just clarify, the, the resolution before the board is related to enforcement of our current cannabis regulations and citations uh, related to, to that specific code section. Um, if the board would be inclined to have a broader discussion about um, uh, collections in general, because the county does not have a collections department, we could certainly bring back an, an item working with administration on a broader discussion of collections across the board for the county that were not related to, to cannabis. Um, the resolution in front of the board today is specific to uh, cannabis cultivation fines. I would, uh, I would, it would seem like, you know, fines are fines. We need to go collect them if you're a homeowner in Rancho Calaveras or you're a cannabis grower. If you break the rules, you should have to fine and you should have the authority to pursue that. It would seem to me that we ought to make those equal because Ed and his office and, and, and the county council's office will be, will be pursuing that. So I would propose that we take this on as a broader resolution to actually accomplish both goals. One thing, if that's a matter of just striking cannabis from this resolution and making it broad, then we can do that now. If it's something we have to do 
later, then I would propose we do that later. I would recommend, because of the way that it was agendized, that if the board is inclined to have, have the broader discussion to take action on this and direct staff to bring um, another resolution forward at maybe the next board meeting to either address a, uh, either just an informational item for discussion or a resolution that broadens the authority of our office. Would it be possible to rehear them both at the same time? Because we're taking a certain class of people and we're making a special rule and we're going to just go prosecute them. And we're not going to prosecute people who are not in that special class of people. Well, I want to clarify, there's nothing that's prohibiting us from taking action to, to seek um, fines or, or um, initiate any kind of claim against any other fine um, for um, Is there a prohibition to cannabis? No. What, so they would fall into that broad category as well? What I'm saying is that right now, in order for us to in initiate a claim, so we actually initiate litigation against a property owner, we need to get authority from the board. So we could come to the board for each and every case, each and every property owner, to seek that authority. Um, this is a broad authority that we're looking for. So when you say that we're kind of creating a special class that's not that's not necessarily the case because this is just a, um, a the blanket authority for this area but it doesn't prohibit us from moving forward and seeking authority from the board on each and every um, fine or each and every citation that is issued by code compliance why would we not just do a blanket for everybody we Everything. can certainly do that if that's what it the board wants to do it can include cannabis it can include people who are not in cannabis who have code violations, why won't we just do one big umbrella, give the county council's office the opportunity to go collect, pursue in court, instead of breaking this into two distinct groups? That would be, sir, that would be fine by me um, if the board were to be inclined to table this item or just continue it, we can modify it or um, just not take action and we can agendize a broader resolution for the next board meeting that would certainly be fine if that's what this board would like to do i would propose that uh, cao you have some comments yeah i would um add first of all this this has been a broader collections has been one of those concern items um on, on the radar for some time certainly we the county has authority to initiate general collections um, where this is a little different, I think, with a new program, significant volume over, over two years we see of just how much has accrued in those fines that, um, like many things, it became the, the iceberg that said, hey, we, we have a problem. What I would suggest, and I don't think the next meeting is timely enough to do it, but what we're undertaking is a review of collections across the county. Um, specifically what um, I had met with human resources and some of my staff to then start to work with each of the departments to identify just how much are we not collecting um, because it is correct that we do not have a centralized collections unit where we're actually um, you know having somebody set aside that that's their desk that's their sole job and when you look at just these numbers um, I want to see how large that overall um, amount could be because it could be significantly larger, in which case I think coming back to the board with a recommendation of how do we develop a collections unit, um, what funding do we tag to it, what are the goals and objectives, because you can do it staffing or you can do it with firms that take it on contingency basis. Obviously then you're collecting pennies on the dollar um, so most of the time you see a two-tiered approach where current is what we're going after, then the stale data is what you send on contingency basis, hoping to at least recoup something. Um, it, for the sake of moving forward on, on this piece, um, I, my suggestion or recommendation would be to allow this to proceed um, because if, if it takes a month or two to come back with a recommendation of a complete program, it's that much more time that we've lost in doing um, 
recovery of those fines? Well, in the resolution that we're looking at, um, that was delivered to the board, um, <clears throat> being a little bit late, but the fact of the matter is if you just cross out the word cannabis, it appears to me it would cover just about everything, including cannabis. It does, however, it does cite section 17.95, which is the enforcement arm of the cannabis ordinance. Okay, I'm just thinking, you know, we've got, we've been hunting cannabis growers and collecting fines for the last two years, and we've accumulated a lot of them. We have to a less extent been pursuing buildings and property owners, yet we've still acquired, you know, four, almost half a million dollars in fines there. Um, so they're both worthy goals. Uh, we've been letting property owners go off the hook for some time. It would seem to me, I would like to see them both proceed together rather than uh, this board. Um, this can have an impact. This will have a, an impact as we start putting court ordered liens on properties and most of these properties are in district two. Mr. Uh, Short, how many of these prop how much of these fines are accumulated district two? Because I'm worried about encumbering property and driving down property values in my district. About 53%. 53%. So this rule disproportionately will impact um, uh, District 2. So it's not only a rule that's for a specific class of people, but a specific area. And I find it to be um, unfair. If I may, I'd like to address the sure. chair. Um, this, this, this proposal came out of uh, enforcement meetings surrounding cannabis. It wasn't our intention to neglect other code enforcement issues. We weren't singling out cannabis. It's just we have Wednesday meetings about enforcement and uh, code enforcement staff has an ongoing complaint that their only recourse at this time is to send out an angry letter and send out a demand. And, and that's where it ends. That's the extent of our current collection practices. And that's uh, fundamentally dissatisfying and unfair to those that do pay. Um, and. Um, it seemed to code enforcement staff that we needed to take extra measures. And until um, you actually raised the issue of other code enforcement um, fines, I had no idea, and neither did Ed, frankly, and, or, or most code enforcement staff, to the extent to which uh, non-cannabis uh, fines had been accruing over the last two years. And it was sort of shocking to realize that it was $470,000. Um, but it's, I would point out to um, that the resolution does cite both 8.06 and 17.95, but I would defer to county council as to whether or not the current resolution before the board can be amended to include uh, both um, uh, items or not. Mr. Chair? Yes. Comments uh, for our staff? Well, let's talk about the issues that are other than cannabis. Uh, do we have any enforcement on those issues documented through an ordinance? And I'm not, I'm not trying to nitpick here. I just want to see if we're going to do this, let's do it completely. Do we have any procedures, uh, yes, any ordinance infecting that? Uh, yes, we do. We have okay. uh, a, a final judgment. What we want to go to is a final judgment. We've done a lot of final demands. Mm -hmm. It's after the administrative hearing. So now we need county council to help us go after for small claims court. That's the process we have right now. You want to add to that? Can, can, I, have, Ed, can I have you speak up when oh, you speak into yeah. I'm not sure everybody can hear what you're Basically, saying. Basically, we've done a lot of uh, final demands after the, uh, the hearings, and so now we want to have county council help us go to small claims court to collect some of the fines that folks have not paid after a long due process of asking for the payment. Okay. In the cannabis arena on these fines, do they fall within the realm of a small claims filing? They're, they exceed the limit, don't Most they? Most of them are. There's some a little larger, but I guess maybe you can... Yeah, it's... Yeah. it's uh, oh, I would be guessing, but I would think about a third only of the cannabis are small claims. Other than that, we'd be looking at limited civil and unlimited civil. Um, I think the highest one is 60000 um, and uh, some of the lower ones are uh, $1,000, $2,000. Okay. Council, if we were to look into this and combine, uh, as we're talking, tabling this and, and make it encompassing 8.06 violations, if you will, and our 17 dot whatever the violation is. Uh, what, what timelines on getting that done realistically? Well, certainly if the board w were to give us direction, we could have it back on the agenda at the next board meeting. 
uh, for purposes of just modifying this resolution to be more encompassing to, re to, to cut out any of the discussion that so relates to 17.95, but have it just be our, our collection of fines as it relates to nuisance abatement. Um, we could certainly do that. That would be a quick turnaround, and then we could agendize a broader discussion informational item. Um, when I say we, meaning staff, um, i.e. the CAO, um, could bring that item to the board for further discussion on a broader countywide um, department of collections or, or a, a broader discussion on collections in general. So that can at least get the ball rolling for us. Uh, at this point, I'd be in favor of doing that. Just, just in all, in all appearance of fairness, I, it's a bad word to use, but in fairness, we should be looking at all of these fines, not just a single item. <coughs> Take cannabis out of the picture, building fines, zoning fines, things like that. We should have a, a, a way to enforce that fairly, and I, I would be in favor of tabling, Mr. Chair, until we can get that information back. Let's hear from two other supervisors have their lights on. Uh, I like to make the vote on it. It's on here today. I think we drifted off on something that's not even on the agenda. I totally agree with Jack that we need to really pursue the other ones. I would like to get this done here today and have at least within uh, this month or next month have what Jack suggested, and we should be looking at that too. I agree with them. But I'd, I really, I'd like them to start collecting this right now and if they wish to put them there, but I, I like to at least get this over where they can start doing and then have something come back to the board and set up a whole committee on collecting funds for us since we don't have one. And I think that's gonna be a lot longer discussion than what we have right here. That's what I would like to see. Thank you, Supervisor Clapp. Supervisor Mills. Thank you. Um, I know that I'd had a discussion in the last meeting about uh, people not getting permits and the only thing that happens when we find them is go get a permit. Uh, we just uh, don't have any structure around collections or fines or anything of that type, but that is a different discussion. This agenda item, it, we need to move forward with it for now, <clears throat> but I think that the broader discussion as uh, Mr. Garamendi has brought out, uh, Supervisor Garamendi, is, is how do we handle debt collection in the longer term and, and in all venues and it's not just cannabis related. It's got to fit within, but we've, we've ignored it for so long. And, and I'm glad to hear that everybody wants to move in a direction of starting to establish some type of policy and a process and a structure around collections in general. But for right now, let's move forward with what the staff has asked us for. That will allow them to get moving on it and uh, then they can bring up the broader discussion or we can have that discussion at a later point. All right, I'll open up for public comments. Marty, you'll have to wait in line in the back, please. I just have two, uh, Bonnie Newman from Double Springs. Um, I'm interested in knowing how much, I mean, we've got 470 in the cannabis category. How much is in the other violations, the code violations and the building violations, how much money are we talking about? And then I may have understood that one way of pursuing this is through small claims. Does small claims, are, are we talking about liens on property if the people are not able to pay? How are we recouping this money um, if they have no money? Is it liens on their property or how is that accomplished? And Stopper District 5. Mr. Chair. Yes. I, I hear a phone ringing. Is that yours? Okay. I'm you, get, you got it off? Did you throw it out the door? Okay. All right. Mr. Stopper. <clears throat> D District 5. We have a problem in District 5, Rancho Calabas. As you've seen in the newspaper recently, there have been many uh, busts down there for indoor grows. Precipitating these busts for these indoor grows is somewhat hard. There's people that live next door to these boarded up homes that they have the whole windows boarded off on the inside and everything else. Some of them have fake lights in the windows so it looks like people are turning off and on lights in the middle of the night. Initially people call, nothing code compliance can do. 
environmental health can do or, or even the sheriff can do because have you seen the marijuana? You know, um, some of these have um, medical grows, caregiver grows, 200 square feet. Turns out they're doing the whole house, over 2,000 square feet. Now, one down the street from me, uh, a couple streets over, it was busted because they had their septic leaking. So finally, when they're dumping their nutrients or whatever into their septic system, inundating their septic system, it started to overflow. So the people I, I talked to them, I actually know them, I was just like, if their septic systems overflow, you have a code compliance issue, and they were able to get to the code compliance and get them out there, and at that point, they knocked on the door, and then they were able to see through one way or another, there's, there's a, quite a bit of marijuana growing inside the house, not just the 200 square feet that they were permitted for outdoors. These issues, now this is where I agree with Jack, because these coincide. The, so we, we are having a hard time getting some of these co-compliance fines from these people because they're being rented out these houses from people out of state. And these people out of state are impossible to get a hold of. So we have to include it all because some of these issues cross and interconnect. Environmental issues, co-compliance issues. Um, it just doesn't have to do with 17.95 in the end. 17.95 and just including that somewhat ties your hands moving forward on the other issues that stack up on top of the cultivation issues and chasing these people out of our county. We have people that have been not been paying their uh, co-compliance fines and we have I mean we have contractors that live in my area that don't follow the, follow the rules and have Sewer illegal sewer discharges that thank we you. need to collect. Thank, from thank you, Mr. Stopper. Uh, Marty Crane. So it, I'm a firm believer that our our board is here to uh, watch the fiscal um, solvency of our county, but also to receive all the information, listen, process all the information and set policy that <clears throat> provides for fair and balanced opportunities for everyone. So it sounds like we've all agreed here that this is not fair, but we could work on it later and make it something more fair. So I don't, I don't um, believe that we should be unfair at any point. And the points that Mr. Stopper just brought up and, and, uh, magnifies the, the point that it is a bigger conversation and thank you for um, bringing this up, Supervisor uh, Garamendi and Oliver, that this is something that we need to talk about um, right away and work on it right away. So that, um, anyway, that's just what I think about it. It's just not fair and it's not right to be not fair today and then put it off and then say, well, we'll be fair tomorrow because we'll write something better. Not fair is not fair. Mr. Stopper. No, will you address the board, please? Okay. But I am addressing you when I say Mr. Stopper, because Mr. Stopper is a very pro marijuana pot growing. growing. Uh, Patty, you need, you need to address the board and speak to the board and not about Mr. Stopper. Well, okay. I am addressing you. You, you, you. By name, you, you can address, say another speaker said something, but let's okay. try and keep it. Another name. speaker has uh, talked about um, marijuana being grown in houses in uh, Rancho Calaveras and um, filling up the houses with pot. And that's just part of the pot industry because if you give them an inch, they will take a mile. And um, the repercussions of what you guys are talking about is going to persecute people that have lost their homes or their properties or 
put them in situations with the Butte Fire or other people. And uh, in favor of the pot industry, and um, I take exception, exception to that. Thank you. Any other public comments? Hi, it's Megan Guthrie, D2. Um, we've lived in this county, I'm sorry, my memory's failing me, 25 years. <laughs> um, when we first bought our house, we didn't realize um, Calaveras County was very poor in their code compliance. And uh, the realtor was very poor in disclosing how poor Calaveras County was in their code compliance issues and that we bought a home not only out of code, but it was also a methamphetamine lab at one point that was not disclosed. Um, I have a neighbor that has lived in a trailer now for 10 years, plus 10 years, and uh, not great conditions. So, um, and then also in public minutes, you hear the sheriff get up and say that he really tries not to do any um, cannabis busts unless there's a nuisance complaint. So um, I am concerned with what Jack brings up, that there's two different groups, because I think that's problematic if uh, you get called for a nuisance complaint and a neighbor just wants to call up and just say, I don't like my neighbor, or I smell something, or give some sort of a nuisance complaint. The next thing you know, the police are on your property, and. Um, things are escalating. <clears throat> I have first-hand knowledge of that. So, um, of things escalating out of control. And then when things escalate, there's no one to call or talk to or de-escalate because we're in a small county. So, I do believe that things should be fair. I think that we should be looking at all code compliance issues, and I don't, do not think that it should be segregated into one group of people. Thanks. Other public comments? George Fry again. <clears throat> I agree with uh, Supervisor Garamendi and Supervisor Oliveira. In uh, late 70, uh, about 76, 77, the code compliance was uh, done out of the uh, planning department and I was chosen to do that. And we didn't have anything, any teeth to do anything. All I could do is go out uh, and remind people that they need to clean up their locations. My favorite customer was Junkie Bill. And it took a long time and constant monitoring of him. So. I would love to see something with some teeth in it that, that takes care of all of the code violations. Thank you. Any other public comment? If not, we'll bring it back. Staff? Uh, <clears throat> just to respond to, I think, one of the questions was the regular code violations. As I mentioned before, 2014 to 2015, there were 86 citations which uh, estimated fines of 881,500. Those were 100% collected. From 2016 to 2017, there was a total of 36 citations with a total of $543,250, which of uh, $470,000 was not collected. Uh, a couple other notes to make that um, in 2014, 2016, uh, the state only allowed $50 per day per violation. Uh, and in, as in 2017, that just subsequently just changed to $100 per day. So you see a little bit of change from the state regulation allowing us to find a little bit more per regular code. As you know, the cannabis is $1,000 per day, so it's a little different on accumulation of fines. On the regular code side, the average of five violations per site, uh, the average administrative cost is about $500. So that gives you kind of an answer to the question, some of the data that we have collected that we have today. I have I have a couple questions for you. Okay. Um, since we're dealing with the 1795 um, specifically here, um, 
of the fines that we're speaking of and we're, we're giving direction to um, and dealing with, what is what is the most outstanding thing that's 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 um, these fines that that's it's it's like channeling a fine. What 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 is causing the fines? What is what is the the, the gears behind it? Is there any specific reasons? Is it different? Is it is it when you go out when code enforcement goes out to inspect for a permit? Um, and the permits are denied, and they're not, after the permits are not, not denied under the urgency ordinance, they're not abating? That, that's correct. So, so it's, it's, not, it's not specifically picking on specific, in the, it is picking somewhat in an industry, but it's an industry that they're asking for a permit, and when we go out for the permit, they're not under guys of what they're supposed to be doing and they're being denied the permit and they're not abating or they're supposed to abate and the fines are going on for either a day, six, 60,000 I think you said, so up to 60 days before they're abated mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, so, so <coughs> yes. the, um, well, the, the difference over the last couple of years is that we had a cannabis ordinance and, and had five and a half FTEs going out patrolling the county uh, issuing citations before there was no such thing. Um, so um, of the 228 citations, for example, that were issued this year, the overwhelming majority never applied for a permit. There's black market growers out there in the woods. And the, the, um, uh, there were, I would say, I'd be guessing, but I think it's fairly accurate to say 50 or so of those 228 had applied for permits and were denied and continued to grow nonetheless. Thank you. Do you have a breakdown on the types of violations that were non-cannabis, i.e., uh, one speaker brought up sewage, dis sewage discharge. I know there's a m million ways to have a violation. I think your rule book is rather thick. Yes. But uh, if you could just in general categorize. I don't have that data right now, but uh, the average of five violations for a lot of times just lack of permits. Uh, sewer is one of the bigger ones that we mm -hmm. see. Uh, that is, but a lot of it, uh, as you know, is permit avoidance out there. Is, is uh, proliferate. Uh, a lot of people just don't get billing permits. So sewer discharge obviously pollutes our water. Now, with environmental which is permits, clearly a major concern of this board. Yeah. A lot of gar uh, garage conversions. A lot of buildings being built without permits. So. Okay, well, Mr. Chair, I'd be willing to make a motion. If you're, um, do, do we have any other comments before? I think it's rather interesting that Mr. Shore brought up permit avoidance. I think that's a good term. And uh, I would hope that whatever motion we craft, that it includes um, how the staff is, direct the staff to come back with some type of a process by which we can get a handle on that as well. That there, we have to be sure that the individuals, when they make that conscious decision to not get the permits that they're required, that they also realize that there is going to be a, a penalty or an expense involved. In Los Angeles County, if you build a structure without a permit, they won't even talk to you until you take the structure down to return the property back to its original condition. We're not in that mode right now, but we, we in essence ignore the idea that uh, you can just simply go as far as you can and see how far you can go before you get away with it. And uh, that has to be included in this discussion and a future agenda item. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make one more comment, if you don't mind, before yeah. there's a vote. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, there is nothing unfair about going after fines for a person who's broken the law, regardless of what, which class of law that happens to be. And, and if you wish to uh, bring back uh, a subsequent um, agenda item for the purposes of going after other code enforcement uh, violations, we can certainly do that. Uh, we haven't singled out anyone uh, for the purposes of discriminating against them. It just happens to be these are the areas of fines that I happen to work on. That's why I created this resolution. Uh, if, if a different attorney representing code enforcement for uh, other matters had brought forward a different matter, that, that's what they would be talking about. Um, so it's not discriminatory, um, and we'd like to get to work on this. And if, and if you want to bring back a, a subsequent um, agenda item to do uh, all code violations, we can certainly do that. Board Chair, I, I would also just add to that in the sense that, you know, this item was related to cannabis because that was what was brought forward by staff. Um, reading through the actual resolution, it references 8.06 and 17.95 because it was related to cannabis. However, 18.06 is our general nuisance 
this is, um, you know, we could certainly modify this resolution to clarify that it that we have authority to initiate or pursue collection efforts for any code compliance fines that would be encompassed by 8.06 and or 17.95. So that could potentially be broader than just cannabis. However, that is just limited to code compliance. Um, there are a, a wide range of other fines that are countywide that we don't have a collection mechanism in place for because we don't have a collections department. So there's still a need for further discussion, a broader discussion. If the board is inclined to want this specific resolution to be broader than just cannabis as it relates to code compliance, so it would include nuisance abatement, um, permit avoidance, whatever it may be, we could certainly modify the resolution accordingly, um, but there is still need for a broader discussion outside of code fines or other fines and other collections that are still outstanding that, that aren't addressed by this resolution. Uh, Mr. Chair, yes, comments? Then why don't we do that? Why don't we go ahead and put forth the effort to do it right the first time? I understand your position and I agree with you. But the bottom line is we need to address problems now. If we're going to go through the effort and the resources to make an ordinance that's going to be enforceable by our code compliance regarding the cannabis system, our building codes, or anything else, let's get it done right. And I think we should take the time to do that. And we can do that within 30 days, hopefully. Well, like I said, the, the resolution before the board, we could make that modification today to give our office the authority to work with code compliance to at least start processing some of these, um, at least initiate the process. That is separate authority from an ordinance. This is just granting authority to pursue um, actions to collect. Okay. Um, that can be done today. If the board wants to do a separate resolution that is broader um, or have a broader discussion beyond code compliance fines, that can be something that can be brought back. But at least, at least adopting or at least granting the, the authority to start the process on whether it be just cannabis related fines or just code compliance fines as it relates to 8.06 and or 17.95 that is something that we would recommend that you at least grant for purposes of today yeah. so we can get the ball rolling I would make a motion that we I would make a motion that we send this back to staff today we keep this item open on the agenda you guys modify it so it's a broader umbrella not just specific um, we have the broader discussion about how we're going to collect, but give you the authority to begin litigation should you so feel, and we take this up later on in this same meeting. I have a motion. I'll second. I have a second. Any comments, discussion? I would just like to clarify, so I fully understand what the motion is, that you want to modify this resolution to be broader for adoption today and then brought back at a future date the broader discussion for things other than code compliance fines? Yeah, I would like to take up the issue of how we're gonna make our collections, but you're, at, you're seeking <clears throat> authorization to, to pursue litigation around collections. I support that and I think we ought to collect them from everybody. And so I would say go back, drop out the references to the ordinance, drop out the cannabis, Give you guys a hunting license. Go for it. I, I think they already have a hunting license. I don't think that's the issue it's here. It's just a again. bag limit. <laughs> it's the authorization to, to season. pursue litigation. So I have a motion. I have a second. A call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. I'd like to make a motion to accept it and instruct the board to come back with what Jack recommended. Staff. Staff to come back with what Jack recommended to get something. Because I think what Supervisor Gamery is talking about is, is a lot broader, it's gonna take more time, and it's gonna take us time. I like to start collecting the fines right now. So, is this, is this within my, my motion is to accept uh, staff's recommendation to start the collections. 
I was, just want to clarify my understanding of what the motion was from Supervisor Garamenti was to make the modifications to the uh -huh. or the resolution in front of the board today for purposes of adoption, dropping out references to cannabis specifically, so that would be a broader grant of authority for our office to pursue um, against any fine associated with code compliance, whether it be 8.06 or 17.95. So that would be granting us the authority to move now on either one and then having a further discussion or broader discussion about fines and collections not related to code compliance or 8.06 or 17.95 at hear, a later date. I didn't hear that. I heard in the motion that it was to send it all back to staff mm -hmm. for a modification yeah. and, a, and come back at a later date. Is that no, my wrong? Was, the motion was to bring it back today to go and take the resolution that currently sits before us modify it by dropping out those references that make it specific to cannabis and granting them the authorization <clears throat> to pursue all fines today today i mean we're already hearing this in other, agenda. in other words we could table this item until after lunch allow staff to modify the resolution over the lunch period to drop references to to cannabis and allow the board to take action as it relates to enforcing 8.06 and 17.95 broader as it relates to code compliance citations and fines. Code compliance, yes, fines. And then bring back at a later date all fines that are not just right. code. All other, uh, all other collection efforts. Yes. Would you, that, would you that, like me to read that's what? That's my motion. Okay. We that's could take that's a, not what I heard either. That's that's what what I heard. Heard. The, broader, the broader question of collections later date. Today, let these guys have the authority to go out and pursue people who have been in violation of code. Is that something you can do? Yes. I mean, quite frankly, I can just read it into the record. The only thing that we would modify the resolution title to read resolution granting authority to initiate litigation for the collection of unpaid administrative fines, period. Delete the rest of the, the title. Um, and then in the first paragraph, we would um, we would, oh, we would, it would read, that's whereas it. Calaveras County Code Compliance in carrying out their enforcement functions pursuant to chapters 8.06 and 17.95 of the county have assessed hundreds of thousands of fines for code violations and stop it there, delete associated with illegal cannabis cultivation activities. Um, And that would be, and that would be the only modifications necessary for the resolution. Would you need to lay it aside to later on in the day to do that, or could we run with it the way you have it right now? Since I read it into the record, we could certainly run with that and then provide the modified language to the clerk for, for posting and um, purposes inclusion. of inclusion into the minutes. I would modify my motion to accept what you just read in the record. So I have a motion by Supervisor Clapp. Second. We have a second by Supervisor Garamendi. Madam Clerk, are you clear? Sure. Okay. So I have a motion and a second. Any other discussion? If not, call for a vote. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5 0. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank, Thank you, you very guys. much. Boy, that was an effort. Yeah. Thank you. <coughs> it's called communication. <laughs> Um, we're at about five minutes to 12 and we're not even through the consent agenda here yet. So um, I would propose, because the next item is probably going to take a little bit of time too. Um, it's a $7 million contract that we're being asked to um, approve. Um, Mr. CAO, uh, Mr. Lutz has pulled item number 24. I, I would ask um, how long and why we pulled 24. Um, I don't imagine very long. That was at the request of Mr. Mason, our um, contractor for tree mortality, um, to be able to at least provide a, a summary or, or a report of activities within the tree mortality program. Um, so it should be a fairly quick item, I would expect. Okay, okay, we'll, we'll move on. Mr. Chair, yeah. could I, can I make a, uh, a recommendation or a suggestion? Sure. That we hear item 24 now and take a late lunch? Thank you. 
Would that work? Because I want to hear what he has to say. Uh, and that's what I was headed toward, that we were going to move and have the do item number 24. Madam Chair, I mean, Madam Chair. But don't worry, Madam we'll make Clerk. That so item 24 is from the Administrative Office to adopt a resolution continuing a local state of emergency on tree mortality. Hey, Will Downs, OES. Uh, this is Tad Mason with TSS, and he's just gonna give you a, a, a brief on uh, what they did this month. So I stand between the, the board and lunch, is that right? Uh, you okay, <laughs> I'll make this quick. Uh, again, Tad Mason, Forrester, TSS Consultants. Um, we have been under contract since October 26th, and we have uh, committed, uh, per the board's request, to make monthly updates on our progress. We're, we're making good progress. The, the first um, item out of the box was an implementation plan, which we submitted December 12th to the board. And uh, since that time, we have received approval from the director to proceed. So that's, that's great right out of the box. Um, we've also created a series of documents, key documents to allow us to do the work, including a right of entry form. We worked with, with Will and County Council to put that together and it is finalized, it's online, and it's being mailed out to uh, selected residents right now in the Blue Lake Springs, Flyan Acres, Pinebrook area, which basically is project number one for removal of hazardous tree mortality, basically. Um, other documents that we've created include the cover letter for that package and an FAQ. It's really important that the residents understand what the mission is of this tree mortality mitigation project. So um, we've also got a, um, a phone number attached to that. So any questions that come up, go right to Dr. Harris, who, who's basically the project manager working for me. And so there is a voice at the end of that phone number for people to call and get an immediate uh, help, hopefully, in filling out the forms. Basically, with the right of entry form signed, then, it allows us as foresters to go out onto the property and fully assess those dead trees and how best to mitigate that hazard. It allows us to measure them, get the height, uh, get the latin long, take a picture, everything that's consistent with CDAA. <laughs> Um, you know, Community Disaster Assistance Agency guidelines so that the county can apply for 75% uh, funds to cover the costs. And then 25%, of course, is applied to Cal, Cal Fire. We're also completely compliant with Cal Fire procedures. So uh, extremely important. Lastly, in the list of documents we've created is an invitation to bid. We, once we have our project lined out, then we put maps for that project and the tree list together and send it out to contractors, tree service contractors, as well as licensed timber operators to actually remove those trees. So it is a process, as you can tell. Um, and it's really important that that invitation to bid process be structured in a way that uh, we cast a wide net to get the most cost-effective approach. And, and hopefully we get some local contractors involved to actually do the work. Any questions so far? <coughs> Supervisor Gurman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> Ted, um, I know we're running things in I know we're running things in staggered starts, but in parallel. So we'll have a lot of projects going on at the same time. Uh, when do you think we'll start issuing? Um, when are we going to have saws running? In um, Blue Lakes. We are targeting March, April. A, a lot falls back on this invitation to bid process. Uh, it has to be posted up to public purchase, which is a website where contractors right. can tie in. And, and that's a like three week, to four week process. And once saws are running, <clears throat> when do we start moving north along uh, to the next sites? Um, We're not gonna finish Blue Lake Springs and then start West Point, it sort of start staggering, correct? Right, and West Point is very high on the list, of course. In our countywide survey, we can tell you that the, the real concentrations are Arnold, Blue Lake, Absolutely. not surprising, Wilseyville, West Point. So uh, that's the order we're, we're, we're working on right now. We intend to present to the Tree Mortality Task Force tomorrow our prioritized areas as we see them now. Um, as you may have seen in the press, there's another million 
dead trees that have been assessed in Calaveras County alone mm -hmm. in 2017. That brings it up to 3.3 million. So there's a, a lot of dead trees out there along, many of them along county roads. So that's our focus. And um, you know we're hoping to get with it, as you can tell. Um, this, this idea of a prioritized project list is really focused on protection of life and property. Right. So, you know, we're not going to go out there and work with the BLM or U.S. Forest Service on some outlying lands right now. We're really focused on residential areas. So, if that is consistent with the board's uh, interest, which we hope it is, we think it would be, then that's our plan. All right. Well, I, I support that concept of how you guys are going about this. When you're ready, do you have, when we're ready to start knocking on doors up in uh, Willsieville and West Point, we'll coordinate together. Look to make sure. to that. And there's no doubt Blue Lake Springs is horrible shape so glad we're on that great and, and in concert with that supervisor we do plan to conduct workshops one of the first ones will be in, in supervisor Oliveira's district focused on the greater Arnold area but we also like to have a, a workshop number two workshop in the, in the West Point Wilsonville area we're not sure what the participation may be we know there's, there's a lot of um, out, out of county uh, ownerships for example in Blue Lake Springs but we will be holding workshops informational hopefully and, and we'll have some participation again working with supervisors to make that happen very important outreach is extremely important here in communications Supervisor Chair, thank you very much for your efforts i know it's, it's a priority obviously for our county but i want to make you aware of what's happening in sacramento as you probably know i'm the county representative for the governor's task force yes uh they are in the process with the 14 high hazard counties which we are one of collecting data for projects already started. Tuolumne has their 42nd project in place. I say that only because they were one of the first six counties. <clears throat> As of yesterday, we are the second county in those 14s that haven't dropped a tree yet, and understandably so. I just want to make you aware, and the public aware, that funding is coming for these programs down the road. And those counties that are engaged in this work are going to get that funding. So we, we started a little late. We understand that. We were brought in out of the second phase. The, the, we were brought in the first six, then we brought in on the 10th. But we have to stay on top of this, ladies and gentlemen, or we're going to lose the opportunity to miss out on $290 million worth of funding that was just released yesterday. For the forest research, uh, for the reforest service program nationwide, so those are things that, that that were discussed in our meeting yesterday, and I'd like to get together with you, Will. Unfortunately, I will not be able to attend the tree mortality meeting because I'll be here, but I want to relate that information so you can disseminate that. Uh, let me know if there's anything I can do on a state level, gentlemen, to to get any requests pushed through the right people and make sure we get this program successful. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Any other board comments? If not, we'll open it for public comments. Any public comments? If not, we'll bring it back to the board. This was um, this not an action item. It was informational. Uh, it was an action. It was adopted resolution. Oh, yes, it was. Yep. So I bring it back to the board. I'm looking for a motion. So moved, Mr. Chair. Second. A motion by Supervisor Allvetter, second by Supervisor Garamendi. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 5-0. We will break for lunch and we will be back in session at 1.30. Good job.